I guess we should probably get started around now. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll share my screen and you will tell me if it works. Can you yeah, see good, that? get started. Is this visible? Yep. Great, yep, okay. Perfect. So, this is a talk I just gave on Saturday, so I'm reusing slides, uh, and uh, I just apologize for that in advance. <laughs> Uh, this is a talk I gave at ShmooCon, which is a hacker conference in, in D.C. Uh, and it's about uh, breaking HTTP servers and HTTP proxies uh, using what we call the HTTP garden. Uh, and this was presented with my uh, collaborator, Prashanth Anantharaman. Um, he's a, an alum from, from my lab here at Dartmouth and uh, hired me as an intern at his company, or the company he works at, which is called Narf Industries. Okay, so a little about me. I'm, I'm Ben Kalis, I'm a PhD student at Dartmouth, and I did most of this work while I was an intern at Narf. Um, I have two cats, they're visible small here in the corner. Um, they'll be in the presentation throughout. Uh, and then Prashanth, who uh, also worked on this, uh, researcher at Narf, graduated from Dartmouth uh, 2022, uh, and uh, he, he did his work primarily on uh, finding uh, vulnerabilities in PDF parsers. Uh, he did some really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, this sort of follows nicely from his work on, on parsing PDF. We moved to parsing HTTP. That's where I got involved. Um, yeah, both of our websites are here uh, if you're interested in finding out more. OK, so timeline here is on March 10th, we got some funding from DARPA to explore uh, parsing problems in HTTP. Uh, this was an extension of, a pro of that PDF uh, parsing project that they had uh, started called SafeDocs. So DARPA had a program SafeDocs. It was for uh, improving PDF implementations as people kept getting hacked through their PDFs. And then uh, there was a what's called an ECP, which is like an extension of SafeDocs for uh, HTTP. This was awarded to this company, Galois. Galois uh, subcontracted to NARF, and NARF hired me as an intern to work on this. Then, about a month later, we found our first vulnerability. And then, in the coming months, we found many, many more vulnerabilities. And then, the project ended uh, November 15th, and now I'm giving this uh, presentation. So, a uh, quick overview of HTTP. Uh, that's how I'll begin, and then we'll move on to all the interesting uh, stuff that we did with it. Uh, so it's a request response protocol, and it's the protocol that your browser is speaking when you go to a website. So I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, HTTP, at least as a, as a name. Uh, so you send a request from your browser to a web server, and the web server sends a response. And uh, you do that many times, potentially, for any individual website. And that's how your browser figures out what information it needs to display to you. OK. So there's three parts to an HTTP request uh, and an HTTP response. Uh, so the first part is called the start line. And in a request, that's going to consist of uh, three parts itself, a verb saying what you want to do, a URI or target uh, saying what you want to access what, what is the thing you want to access with the verb? And then a version string saying what version of the protocol you want to use. So in this case, we have get saying, I want to get this resource, slash, which is the root of the web server, uh, which is usually just the first request your browser will make when you're visiting a website. And then uh, HTTP 1.1, which is, of course, HTTP 1.1. I'm saying I'm using version 1.1. Then we have this carriage return line feed after that, CRLF, uh, or backslash R, backslash N. Uh, and that's just how lines are ended in the HTTP protocol. OK. Then we have these key value pairs uh, separated with colons. And these are called headers, uh, which is sort of confusing because normally when I hear header, I'm thinking that's the beginning of the thing we're talking about. But the headers actually come in the middle after the start line. So keep that in mind. Headers come in the middle. <laughs> uh, and headers are. Uh, they're just, they can basically have arbitrary values. There are a few rules on what can go in a header, but uh, essentially you have uh, the, the first part of the header, the key, uh, should most of the time look like ASCII text. 
and the second part of the header can be something almost like arbitrary binary payload, but there's certain uh, specific bytes that are not allowed within HTTP header. And some headers are meaningful and other headers are not. So uh, the, the protocol defines that, you know, when you receive a header that says content length, then it must have a numeric value. And that numeric value describes the length of the next part of the message, uh, which is the message body, which is here at the bottom, live free or die. Uh, and it content length just describes the number of bytes in the message body uh, in, you know, ASCII encoded decimal. Okay, so then you also see this header moose here. This is just a, a, a header I made up uh, and it contains a, an emoji in the value. Now I didn't actually check that the UTF-8 encoding of that emoji does not contain any of the invalid, of the disallowed bytes, but I'm just gonna assume that it does not. Um, this header will, 99% of the time you send a header that is not real or not used by the endpoint and it will just be ignored. So uh, this Moose header, if we were to send this request to Dartmouth.edu, um, then uh, the Moose header would just be not considered at all. It wouldn't cause the message to be rejected. It would just not be uh, not be considered. Okay, so these are this is the three parts of the request. You have the start line, the headers, and the body. And one way to specify the length of the body is this content length header here. Okay. A response looks very similar. Um, so you have, again, a start line, but the order of things is flipped. So now you have the version at the beginning, and then instead of having a target and a verb, you have a status code and you have a status string. So the status code, that's a three-digit number uh, that just says what essentially is the one-word summary of the response. So 200 means yes. And 400 means your response doesn't make any sense or your request doesn't make any sense. And 404 means I didn't find the, the resource you're asking for. And 403 means I'm not allowed to find the resource you're asking for. And you know, there's many, many more of these. And then after that, you have a string that just reiterates what the code means. So you can actually put anything there, um, but most commonly when you see a 200, the string is gonna be okay. So, uh, the response, HTTP 1.1 200 OK means, yes, I got the resource you're asking for. Here it is. Then you have a bunch of headers, uh, and the headers have largely the same meaning, including content length, which means exactly the same thing in this context. And then you have a message body. Um, one more thing to note, headers are totally optional. You can send zero headers, and that's allowed. The message body, also totally optional. You can send no message body, and that is also allowed. Uh, the headers and the message body are separated by two carriage return line feeds in a row. Um, and yes, I've already explained carriage return line feed, CRLF, backslash R, backslash N, all the same thing. Okay. So just to go over some HTTP methods, we've got get, ask for a resource. Post, that's send some data to the server uh, at a particular location. Delete is to request to delete a resource. And there are many, many more of these uh, verbs, and uh, they have varying levels of, of use. So when you send a request and then you receive a response, this is all going to happen over TCP. And TCP uh, would be a waste in general to uh, open a new TCP connection for every single HTTP request response pair, because uh, presumably you're, if you're going to make a lot of requests and receive a lot of responses, you could just keep open the same connection and send them all back and forth. So that's exactly what servers do. This is uh, what we're calling ping ponging. And so it's just when a client sends a request to a server and then the server responds and then the client sends another request and then the server responds and this just goes back and forth until one or the other decides to close the connection. Okay, then there's pipelining, which is the other way of reusing TCP connections in HTTP. And that's just when the client sends many requests at the same time. And then the server responds to all of them uh, at once. Okay, so those are the two ways of reusing connections. 
uh, now the background section is done, and we can get into some of the vulnerabilities that we found uh, when we were just playing with HTTP implementations. All right. So the first uh, sort of major uh, bug we found was in this embedded web server called Sysanta Mongoose. So Sysanta Mongoose is uh, it's primarily used in little weird embedded systems that run in people's closets or in uh, factories and stuff like that. They claim to run on the ISS. Um, it's written in C. There's about 10,000 of them. If you look on Shodan right now facing the internet, but presumably there are many more than that on people's local networks that are not just exposed to the, the open uh, internet. Okay, so I'm gonna do my first demo. Uh, is this, um, tell me when this font size is visible. Is this visible? I can see it. Okay, cool. It looks okay. Great. All right. So I've got um, an instance of Mongoose here. And I've also got a container from which I'm going to send some requests to that Mongoose server. So I'm going to start out by just sending a basic uh, get request at the Mongoose server. And I think it's on 8,000. Yeah. OK. So here we get back a bunch of HTML. So this is the HTTP protocol you know, in its purest form. We are literally just typing into Netcat. Uh, we send a GET request. We're asking for slash HTTP 1.1, no headers, no body. And we get back a whole bunch of HTML. So Mongoose is definitely working. It's up and running. OK, now let's add a message body. So we'll type in content length uh, 10. And then we'll just add in 10 bytes here. and that is 10 bytes. If I send this to Mongoose, it's exactly the same thing. And this is because in a GET request, the standard defines no meaning for a message body in a GET request. Usually that means that servers just ignore them. So if you send a GET request to the message body, it might be meaningful in, some, in the context of some applications, but most of the time it just gets ignored. Uh, and in this case, yes, it just got ignored. This is just the example application that ships with Mongoose. It's just acting as a file server. Uh, so you can see it's, it's listing out uh, the contents of the directory that it's running from. OK, so then I was just, just kind of messing around with this request, typing in, you know, editing this request and sending it to Mongoose and see what, what happened. And I tried putting a minus sign right here. And when I sent that, then I, something weird happened. I still got back all this HTML, as I did before. But I also got back a 404 right after. And if I look at the server log, is this visible, this, this uh, left-hand side of the, the window here? Yeah. OK, yeah. So this we see a get request for slash followed by an h colon request for minus 10. And so this really looks a lot like this. So that got me wondering, OK, this we've got, if I send minus 10 there, uh, this is six bytes long, h colon space minus one zero. And if we include the carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed that ends the headers, then we end up with a 10 byte long negative slice from the end of the headers. So then I was wondering, if I change this to 11, presumably this will then become th colon minus 11 uh, inside the server log. So I, I did that. And that is what happened. And then I was wondering, OK, that's pretty weird. So if I send this one request, I get two responses, because it's, it's interpreting this, this slice of the request as its own request. So what if I figure out how long is this entire headers and, uh, and request line? Because if I could skip back to the beginning of this whole thing, maybe it would parse the entire request twice. So if we just take the length of this. It's 39 bytes long. And 39 is the same number of digits as 11. So we can just substitute it in right there. And if I send that request, 
then the server enters an infinite busy loop in which it no longer responds to anything. So that was pretty surprising. Uh, and you can see here, it's still just going, uh, endlessly parsing and reparsing the same 39 byte request. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then I tried sending a normal request again, just to see if it would, if it would respond. Uh, and it won't. So it's, it's actually just locked up. Uh, it, it can't be, can't be removed from this, uh, from this loop. So you just have to kill the server, uh, in order to, uh, get that, get that to stop just going forever. Okay. So just to reiterate, the reason this works is that Mongoose supports pipelining. Uh, so pipelining is when you just put two requests concatenated together on the same connection, and then you receive two responses. Um, and because of that, the way they're handling it is they, in order to find the next request in the pipeline, they add to the address of the end of the headers, the size of the message body to skip over the message body to end up at the beginning of the next request. Uh, so if that offset is negative, then you could skip back to the beginning of this request and end up repart in a loop parsing the same request over and over. So we reported this bug. Uh, the fixes were introduced about a month later. Uh, we got a CVE assigned for it. Um, initially, the CVE just said that Mongoose accepts negative content length, which does not at all get at the fact that you can just completely shut down the whole server by sending a, a, a request with a negative content length. They did eventually update the CVE. Um, and we didn't ask for it. So I'm actually not sure who, who ended up updating the CVE, but someone, someone noticed and got that fixed. Um, however, because this is an embedded web server, it's mostly running on little weird systems. Uh, it supports tons and tons of architectures and, and like microcontrollers and things like that. So uh, if you just go on Shodan and look, still the vast majority of servers running, or of, of computers that are running this web server are, are remain vulnerable, and uh, I'm not going to admit to having tested this, but uh, if, if you're curious, you can with a good VPN and uh, see what happens. Okay, second vulnerability uh, that we uh, discovered that I'm going to talk about is uh, is one in this web server called Lightspeed. Now, Lightspeed is it turns out the third or fourth most popular web server by number of sites hosted depending on who you ask. And uh, that was a surprise to me because I had never heard of this web server. But it turns out the reason for that is that nearly everyone using Lightspeed is using it with WordPress. So they target WordPress users. Uh, and their argument is like, we're the best WordPress web server. We'll make your WordPress site twice as fast or whatever their, their marketing says. Um, so it's all, they're all in on WordPress, uh, and that's why I've never heard of them, because I never, ever think about WordPress. Um, but I, I looked up what are the most popular web servers uh, when trying to figure out what servers to implement, and I found this one. Um, or what servers to instrument, is what I should have said, uh, and I found this one. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, I'll again, walk through the uh, kind of thinking when I was playing around with, uh, with Lightspeed. And I'll show you what I noticed. So I was, uh, I set up Lightspeed. I just set up the example application uh, and I sent it a get request. And uh, that example application runs on port 8088. And uh, so I sent that request, um, just get slash most, you know, simplest HTTP request I could think of. And I get back a whole bunch of HTML. Um, and yeah, just quite a bit of HTML, enough HTML that I don't want to scroll through it all. So I'm going to just grab for HTTP and you can see we get back a 200. Okay. Plus some HTML. So yes, this is behaving as you would expect. All right. And then I said, okay, I'll send a pipeline request. So two requests in a row and, uh, I'll, I'll still grab for HTTP because it'll be too much output, but what we expect here is that we'll get two 200 OKs. 
So we're sending two get requests. We're going to get two yes responses. And yeah, that is what we see. Uh, so Lightspeed is definitely capable of doing pipelining. And then I decided, well, I could just add a, a message body here, just as I did before, into that first request. And uh, this should also work. Uh, so here, now we can really see you know, pipeline requests. You've just got the second request squished right up against the message body of the first. But it knows how long the, the message body of the first request is, so this should cause no problems. And yes, it actually does cause no problems. So we still have two 200 OKs. All of this looks totally fine. And it was at this point that I said, all right, what if I put a zero right here? So this should do nothing. Uh, putting a zero right here is just putting a leading zero onto a number. And so that should actually have no effect at all. But when we hit Enter, we see that we get a 200 and a 400. Now, 400 is the response you get when you type in a request that is just invalid. Uh, so like a request that's malformed in some way, uh, the parse of the request failed. So that's pretty weird uh, because we added a leading zero to a number. So that definitely shouldn't cause this. Uh, but more importantly, seemingly, uh, we added the leading zero onto the, the content length of the first request but it invalidated the second request. And that's even stranger. So then at that point, I was kind of just too confused and I decided to look at the code. And this is what I saw. So here in the code, uh, this is the line of code that parses the content length. Lightspeed is written in C. Uh, it's not, it's, Lightspeed, as used by most WordPress users, is actually a proprietary product, but most of the basic functionality is available in their open core version of the software. So that's open Lightspeed. That's what we were testing on. And that's how I was able to verify the source code. Um, so this is what we have. We have They're using this function stir to ll, which is a libc function. Uh, and it's an integer parser. So it takes a string, and then it takes uh, an argument that's not very important because they just don't use it, they pass in null. And then it takes a, uh, a base in which to interpret the string. So like if the base is 10, the string is interpreted in decimal. And if the base is two, then the string is interpreted in binary. Uh, but what they're actually doing when they parse content length is they're passing in a base of zero. So a base zero number, I don't really, I don't think that's real. Um, uh, I don't, do any of you guys have, uh, off the top of your heads, know what uh, happens when you pass in zero to stir to LL as the base? <laughs> yeah, I think it's treated as octal. It's almost that. It's pretty. That's pretty close. It's um. It's it's. It might be treated as octal, but it's it's. It actually will try to guess. So it'll treat it as uh, base. 10 if the string does not start with the zero. And it'll treat it as base 16 if the string does start with zero x. And then it will treat it as base eight octal if, it, uh, if, the, if the string you're parsing starts with a zero. So then this explains what's going on. So it is the, the string inside the request we sent is interpreted in octal. Uh, yeah, I think it would be interpreted as octal uh... Only if it began with zero and did not contain either an eight or a nine. I think if it contains eight or nine, then it will, it sets this error pointer. So if the, at the instance of the first eight or nine, it will basically stop parsing and it'll return to you through this uh, second argument, the location of the eight or nine. So I'm pretty sure that's the behavior. I'm not a hundred percent sure I'd have to check. Uh, but at least that's the behavior in base 10. When you put in 10 and you pass in characters that are invalid, it just tells you the location of the first invalid character. Um, anyway, so now we can see the interpretation here. The first request, when we have no leading zero, it sees the message body as expected. When we add the leading zero, it now interprets this 0, 1, 0 as, you know, in octal. So that's going to be 8. So it's only going to see the first 8 bytes of the message body as being... Uh, part of the message body. And the next two bytes are going to just get stuck onto the beginning 
of the next request. So that means the method of the second request is interpreted as 8.9.get. And that explains why we receive a 400, because 8.9.get is just not an HTTP method. <laughs> OK. So we found this bug. And this doesn't really seem like too much of a vulnerability. It's kind of just a bug. Uh, we can get the server to misunderstand what we are saying, but we're the ones saying it, and it's only talking to us. So presumably, this doesn't actually matter. <clears throat> that's what, that's the argument my, my cats here are making. And I would agree with them if there were only two servers or only me and the server uh, in the loop here. But there's actually very frequently going to be more servers. So uh, on the web, when you connect to a web server, very likely the server that hosts the website you want to talk to is not the first server that you're connecting to. So there's going to be a big chain of HTTP servers uh, involved in serving your request. And there are many reasons for this. So one is that uh, if you stick a server in front of your server, uh, then you can you can start caching resources in the first server so that you don't have to bother your application server. You can have a dedicated caching server that, uh, you know, if, if a thousand people ask for your front page, you only need to serve it to the first one from the web server. And then your server in front can just remember that you the front page looks like this and serve it as is to the 999 other people. Uh, you also have... Uh, uh, connection sharing. So maybe your backend server isn't great. It doesn't have uh, you know the greatest performance, uh, and it would be it would be a waste to open a connection to every single new client who wants to talk to the server. Uh, but you have a very high performance front end server that can open connections all day long to your to your many uh, clients, and then it can just keep open a few persistent connections to the backend server and send all of their requests over those. So it can optimally. Uh, distribute requests over those few connections. You also might just have multiple different backend servers that are serving portions of your uh, your front page, and uh, you can you can route requests correctly with a front end server. So you know uh, my favicon is is stored on server A, and my HTML is on server B. So I take the request for the favicon and I route it to server A, and I take the request for the HTML, I route it to server B. They respond, and I forward both of them back onto the client. That sort of thing. You can also do uh, access controls inside of the these uh, HTTP uh, middle boxes. So you can say something like, don't allow anyone to ask for my private key uh, that I keep inside of my server root unless that person is coming from the local network. Those sorts of rules. So this is the general workflow. Uh, as I just said verbally, uh, your browser will send a request to a proxy to a, a middle box. That middle box will forward the request onto a server. Uh, and very likely, that server is only visible to the middle box. So you couldn't even send a server uh, a request directly to the server. You would need to pass through the middle box in order to, to talk to this particular server. Then the server is going to respond to the middle box, and the middle box is going to respond to uh, your browser. And in this particular example, I'm using uh, HAProxy as an example of, of such a middle box. Um, there are many, many different uh, uh, programs that can serve this role. OK, so among those server programs that can serve this role, uh, they all basically have the same functionality uh, in, in their simplest form. They accept requests. They might rewrite them or insert headers or you know, change things around. Uh, and then they forward them on to some other server. And then they collect the responses, of course, and send them back as well. So for our purposes, uh, you know, an HTTP proxy and uh, you know these caching servers, uh, load balancers that distribute requests over many instances of, uh, of the same web application, uh, they're all really the same thing. They're just taking requests, rewriting them, forwarding them. Um, and uh, a, a CDN like uh, Akamai or Fastly really is also doing the, ver the very same thing. Uh, so it's just taking requests and sending them to your server uh, and doing some caching and access controls along the way. OK, so now I'll show you another demo. And this one will, will hopefully convince you that these sorts of innocuous parsing problems might actually matter. <clears throat> OK, 
So here what I've got set up is very much like the picture I showed you a second ago in the slides. So it's an instance of HA proxy uh, configured to point at the same instance of light speed that I had up before. So if I send a request to HA proxy, just a get slash uh, on port 80, then it's going to forward that request to Lightspeed. Lightspeed is going to respond. And then HA proxy will forward Lightspeed's response back to me. So if I, uh, if I pipe this into head, you can see there's this uh, header set here. It says server Lightspeed, right? So this is a direct indication that HA proxy proxied my request over to the instance of Lightspeed and then collected Lightspeed's response. OK, so that's, that's the most basic configuration that I've given HA proxy. I've, I've set up a few other things. So one, I've set up HA proxy to uh, reject requests that ask for slash dot SSH slash ID RSA. So if I ask for that, right, that's an RSA SSH private key, which you should not store inside of your server root. But if you did, um, even if you did, HA proxy would hopefully save you, right? So if I send this request, HA proxy uh, I've, I've written in its config file not to allow requests that look like this. Uh, so it tells me 403. It tells me I'm not allowed to get that resource. And then uh, I've also set up caching. And we'll see how that uh, comes into play in a minute. OK, so uh, I, I want to get past this, uh, this access control list. It would be really nice as an attacker to be able to not care about whatever rules my target has set up inside of their HA proxy config. I just want to steal that private key. I don't really care that you have set up a rule to block it. And it would be nice if I could get around HA proxy's uh, uh, filter. So here's a payload that might be able to do that. Let me take this and copy it. And then I'll try to explain what's going on. So. Um, Presumably, HA proxy does not have the same bug as Lightspeed, meaning that like a, a leading zero on a length field to HA proxy should be meaningless. Whereas to Lightspeed, of course, as we saw, it, it's going to interpret that number in octal when it sees that leading zero. Uh, so this payload, from HA proxy's perspective, will look like one request. It will see a get request for slash with a content length of 200, followed by a message body consisting of 200 bytes. So it just so happens that this particular highlighted region of the request is 200 bytes long. And so this is going to be one complete request. This whole thing will be one complete request uh, from the perspective of HA proxy. Then when HA proxy forwards the request, it'll forward it to Lightspeed. And Lightspeed will interpret this 0200 as being 0200 in octal, so 128. So HA proxy will, will see one request, but Lightspeed will see two requests. Lightspeed will see one request that has a message body consisting of 128 A's. So these are just padding characters that I put here, and there's 128 of them, followed by a second request that asks for the protected resource, .ssh slash ID RSA. And then it just has enough padding after that to get out to 200 bytes for the whole message. So ideally, this would get past our, our access controls. Uh, if I sent this to HA proxy, then I should get two responses, one that's benign and one that gives me the private key. Except when I do this, I still only get some HTML. So maybe I'll, I'll pipe that into grep and see uh, how many responses I get. And it's only one. OK, so maybe what's happening is this. I send a request with netcat that is one request from the perspective of HA proxy. HA proxy forwards that request to Lightspeed, and Lightspeed sees two requests. Then Lightspeed actually responds twice, once with benign HTML and once with the OpenSSH private key. But then HA proxy should know, OK, one request generally means one response. So why am I getting a second response? This is probably a mistake. And so maybe HA proxy just drops it on the ground and just forwards on only the first of the requests. So if that were the case, there would be a pretty simple solution to this whole problem, which would be uh, to just change the payload so that 
HA proxy and Lightspeed agree on the number of requests in the payload, but they maintain the disagreement about the content of those requests. So if I just add a second get request right on the end, or really a third, right, a third get request right on the end of this whole payload, then uh, HA proxy would see two requests and Lightspeed would see three. So in order to account for that, we can just take the length of, of this next request. Uh, and that's 18. And in fact, I'm actually going to add one extra thing here. I'm going to add a host header, which I will explain in a minute. So the length of this new request uh, that I'm adding to the end with the host header is 33. OK. So if I take 33 and I add it to this length 23, I'll end up with 56. And now uh, Lightspeed will see two requests again. So it'll see one request here and one request here. And HA proxy will also see two requests. It'll see one request here and one request here. OK. So if I send this to HA proxy, then I've just gotten the private key. So we actually did get through the access control list uh, before, even. But we didn't realize because HA proxy dropped that extra response on the ground. But if we just make them agree on the number of requests, but maintain the disagreement about what those requests are, then uh, we, can, we can actually exfiltrate the private key. And we can actually take it a step further. So I added this extra header here to the, to the smuggled, or to the, to the final request in the, in the chain, which is uh, a host header saying the host is HA proxy. And the reason for this is that HA proxy can do caching, but it won't do any caching unless a host header has been set. So if I now, if I just w get HA proxy, I get this index.html. And if I look at that, I also get the private key. And that's really strange. But it makes sense when you think about HA proxy's interpretation, because as far as HA proxy is concerned, this request was sent and a private key was received. And that request is a cacheable request. So as far as HA proxy is concerned, it sees a request, it sees the response, it saves the response. The next time it receives a request that is of the same, you know, asking for the same cacheable resource, it serves up the same response. And so that's why we can now, if we were to visit this with a browser or wget or curl, we get the private key instead of the front page of the website. Uh, so that's a pretty cool uh, sort of consequence of this whole type of bug, right? I mean, initially, this seemed like it was just a weird mistake on, on behalf of, uh, of Lightspeed. But it turns out that this is actually exploitable in this relatively prevalent context. OK. Also, uh, when we were putting this, uh, these slides together, we put these, uh, these demos into a public GitHub repo, uh, which is up here. It's under uh, my, my GitHub account, Ken Bayless slash Shmukon demos, uh, with an underscore between those two words. So you can, you can run these for yourself if you'd like to play with them. Uh, and uh, we got a notification saying not to put private keys in public repos. But I don't think that is, uh, uh, I don't think that rule applies in this context. OK, so this is called request smuggling, this, uh, this whole idea that uh, you, the front end server and the back end server disagree about how to interpret the same request data. Uh, when the front end sees benign requests and the back end sees malicious requests, you can bypass an access control list. When the front end sees something cacheable, then you might be able to poison the cache. Uh, and uh, this is another sort of responses to differ from the number of responses. You can sometimes get front-end servers to serve responses to the wrong user. And this is very hard to pull off in practice uh, or in even in like a controlled environment. I did try for a few hours, and I just couldn't get it to work. But uh, I have accidentally done it a few times. Uh, it, this is called desynchronization, uh, HTTP desync. And, and you can look it up. Um, there have been a, a few good blog posts about it. Uh, and there was a... Uh, um, yeah, there was a, I think it was a DEF CON talk uh, a few years ago about on this. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty well-known uh, 
sort of attack vector, but sort of difficult to get that desync uh, working working in, in the wild. Um, but when you get it to work, wow, is it crazy? Because you just start getting data intended for random other people. Very cool. <clears throat> okay. So just to reiterate, uh, here's here's just a graphic showing uh, HA proxy's interpretation of the payload and Lightspeed's interpretation of the payload. And uh, you know, in short, there are three request lines inside of this payload. HA proxy sees the first and third as being meaningful, and Lightspeed sees the first and second as being meaningful. And it just so happens that the second bypasses the rule that HA proxy has, is supposed to be applying on all requests that go through it. Okay, so here we have some uh, rude feedback from my cat, Dale. Uh, he's saying that, uh, you know, this really shouldn't be that hard. Uh, content length is an integer. It's just an integer. So just parse it correctly and uh, everything should be fine. And he's, yeah, he's right. I mean, these mistakes we've seen are actually just dumb mistakes. Uh, if, if only they parsed that content length field correctly, then everything would actually be fine. Except there are a few exceptions to uh, to what Dale is saying here. Uh, it turns out there are some contexts in which the content length is not the way that you determine the length of the message body. So the standards uh, define uh, eight different rules for determining how long a message body uh, is, which is, in my opinion, seven rules too many. Uh, the first of these rules is an exception to the, the whole content length thing. It says, if you ever receive a response to a head request that contains a 100 response or a 1xx response code or a 204 or a 304, then there's never a message body. Even if there is a content length inside of the headers, you, you just ignore it. So that's one exception. Then there's also an exception for the connect request, which is that uh, after a 200, a 2xx response to a connect request, then uh, you also ignore content length in that context. Um, and then uh, if you receive this special header called transfer encoding, along with content length, then there's a, a different way to interpret the message body. Uh, so that, that's an exception. Uh, and transfer encoding overpowers content length. Uh, it turns out there's three more separate rules about transfer encoding. So if, if the transfer encoding header takes on a particular value, i.e. the string chunked, uh, and that string is really the transfer encoding header is supposed to be list valued. So if, this, if that string is the last element of the list, case insensitive, uh, then uh, um, that has its own set of, of rules. And then if the transfer encoding header is present in a response, but it doesn't have chunked as the last thing in the list, uh, then you determine the message body by just reading out the connection until it gets closed. And then uh, if the transfer encoding header is present and the chunk transfer coding is not the last one in the list, then you can't determine the length reliably if this message is a request and not a response. So the server has to respond 400 and then close the connection. Okay, and then if you have a transfer encoding with an invalid content length, there's separate rules for that. And if there's a content length with no transfer encoding, that's the, the primary rule we've seen. That is handled in the normal way, as, as we saw earlier. Uh, but then if none of the above are true and the message is a request, so if none of the previous rules apply uh, for a request, then that means that the message body length is zero. So you should assume that on a request when there's no content length, there's actually no body. But if it's a response, you actually make the opposite assumption. So if there's a response with uh, no content length or transfer encoding set, then the message body is actually going to be everything after that request or after that response on the connection until the, the, the server closes the connection. And then there's actually just a big blob of text containing about five more paragraphs of exceptions to all of these rules. Uh, so it turns out that um, that this whole content length thing is, is just really not as simple as it seems. Okay, so I mentioned this transfer encoding uh, thing earlier. Uh, I should probably explain what that is. That's probably the most important one of those rules that I listed. Uh, so when the transfer encoding header takes the value chunked, and, and really the transfer encoding header is this list valued header 
And so there's more complicated rules about, it's not just if it says chunked, but if it says some other stuff, comma chunked, then that's equivalent sometimes. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if basically this is the simplest scenario and, and the most common where you just have a transfer encoding and the value of the header is chunked, uh, the, the string chunked. That has a special meaning. And that means that the message body is no longer determined by the content length header. That means the message body is now going to be sent in a bunch of pieces. Usually this is going to be done because you don't know exactly how long the message body is going to be when you start writing the request. So the pieces look like this. You have length followed by data. Uh, so the length uh, here is given in, in yellow and it's, it's always provided in hex. So uh, A means 10. Then you have a carriage return line feed and then you have that many bytes of data and then another carriage return line feed. And then you can put another chunk. So here we have one A, so 26, uh, carriage return line feed, all the letters of the alphabet, carriage return line feed. And you might notice right here, the second carriage return line feed here is actually not really necessary. If we were redesigning the standard, we could just save two bytes, right? We've, we've already put a length field on this and delimited it from the data. So we could have omitted that, but remember that HTTP is a, it's a text protocol optimizing both for being able to be understood by machines and also by people. So having line endings here makes the whole thing more readable. And that's presumably why that line ending is there. Um, okay. And then you can send, you know, more and more chunks. Uh, and the whole sequence of chunks is terminated by sending an empty chunk. So zero followed by two carriage return line feeds indicates the end of the chunked message body. Okay, then there's this extra weird uh, thing in the grammar that no one uh, uses at all uh, called chunk extensions. And this is where you have some optional white space after a chunk uh, length, followed by a semicolon, followed by more optional white space, uh, followed by a key value pair where the value might be quoted and then you can comma separate more of these key value pairs. Uh, except if you're parsing these, you actually can't just split on commas because you can put commas inside of the quoted strings. So that's the, uh, that's the amount of forethought and care that went into designing this protocol. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is called a chunk extension. And the original purpose was so that you could check some of the, uh, the data chunks, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but no one uses them in the wild. They're basically just a vestigial remnant of an old protocol from days of yore. And uh, yeah, most uh, proxy servers and CDNs will actually just rip them out before uh, forwarding requests because no one uses them and uh, they're just kind of more complicated to handle. So if you send a request that looks like this to Google Cloud, for example, uh, as of relatively recently, it will um, it'll actually just remove all of these these chunk extensions. Okay, then this I mentioned this optional white space before the chunk extension. This is what the standard calls bad white space (BWS). Uh, so that basically means that when you receive a request, if you're a server receiving requests, then when you get a request with white space in that location, that means you should accept that white space, but you aren't required to but you definitely are required to never produce white space in that location. So it's saying white space is allowed here for historical reasons, but definitely don't make any white space there if you're sending a request yourself, which means that a transducer is basically obligated to remove any white space from that uh, field before sending it along. Okay, but then the natural next question is what is white space? Uh, what characters count as white space according to the protocol? Uh, and what characters specifically count as BWS, right? Could, could fit in this white space field. So um, RFC 9112, that's one of the HTTP standards, says uh, that BWS is defined to be, go look at uh, RFC 9110. So if you go look at RFC 9110, then it defines BWS to be OWS, which stands for optional white space. So, so far we've learned nothing and optional white space, uh, we can go into RFC 9110 and see what that actually is defined to be. And it is any number of spaces or tabs. 
So it seems like we've solved the problem, right? Uh, as far as the grammar is concerned, the only thing allowed here is any number of spaces or tabs. Except then RFC 9112 also says that there are certain contexts in which recipients may parse uh, on white space delimited word boundaries aside from the carriage return line feed uh, terminator to treat any form of white space as, the, as, as though it were space. Um, uh, and that includes uh, spaces, tabs, vertical tabs, form feeds, and carriage returns on their own, not followed by line feed. Um, OK, and then further, it turns out that uh, uh, kind of earlier in the standard, it also mentions that um, if you receive a carriage return that is not uh, followed by a line feed in any part of the message except for the message body where anything is allowed, right? The message body just contains arbitrary uh, binary data. But the um, anywhere else in the message, if you get a carriage return on its own, then you've got to consider that message to be invalid unless you decide to change that carriage return into a space, which you might also do and is, is allowed, but you are not required to do that. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the standards take on white space, uh, which is weirdly complicated uh, uh, as an answer to the question, what is white space? Okay, so the, the natural sort of next question after that is, uh, okay, we've now learned that uh, you're not allowed to forward any white space in this particular spot. Uh, and the definition of white space is, uh, it's complicated. Um, so let's just see what HTTP transducers actually follow all of these rules uh, and, and don't allow carriage returns within, um, within that, that particular bad white space field. Um, or I guess more interesting is what transducers do allow those carriage returns. So uh, it turns out that until recently, Google Cloud, uh, their load balancer, would forward carriage returns inside of that position. And so would Akamai, uh, and so would Apache Traffic Server. So Apache Traffic Server, that's a load balancer. Uh, it's used at Yahoo and uh, uh, MSN and a few other places, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, it's an Apache project. It's it's you can look it up. Uh, uh, Akamai is a very popular CDN. Um, uh, Akamai and Google Cloud have have fixed this now, but uh, Apache Traffic Server has not, even though we've reported it privately and then publicly, and now it's just sitting there and it's just public, and that's uh, that's the state of that. Okay, it turns out there's a a pretty popular endpoint HTTP parser that has an interesting misinterpretation of carriage returns in that particular location. So uh, when you send a carriage return followed by any byte to this server, it's going to treat it as though it received carriage return line feed. And that server is uh, the Node.js uh, HTTP module from the standard library. So Node.js is, of course, very popular. The HTTP module is very popular. That's what's used for uh, Google Cloud Functions, for example. Uh, which is like the sort of AWS Lambda equivalent on Google Cloud. Um, so they've, they've also fixed this bug uh, thanks to our report, but not um, not in a feature, I'm sorry, not in a, a, uh, a security release, only in a feature release. So uh, if you just apt install Node on, on Debian Bookworm, you actually still get the buggy version of Node. Okay, so yeah, these are complicated rules. It's not surprising that uh, lots of servers would uh, mess them up. Um, yeah, these are these are easy rules to break. So I'm now going to show you uh, a final demo, and this is just um, taking advantage of that uh, discrepancy I just described, having to do with bad white space and carriage returns and uh, Node.js thinking that carriage returns are the same as carriage returns. Uh, so I'm going to start up Apache Traffic Server and Node and my attacker container. And uh, now what I've got uh, configured here is very similar to what I had earlier, right? So I have this uh, this transducer, Apache Traffic Server, uh, instead of HA proxy, but serving the same role. And instead of Lightspeed, I have Node.js, but it, yeah, serving the same role. So I've got a very simple web app running on Node.js. If I type a request into Apache Traffic Server on port 80, I get back some HTML. 
and that HTML is just saying that it was served by Node.js. And if I try to send a delete request to that Apache traffic server, then I get told no. So Apache traffic server does not accept delete requests uh, just from anyone. Uh, so it's going to tell me, no, you can't delete slash on my back end. That would be uh, deleting the server root, and that's not allowed. All right, but I want to bypass that rule, and here is how I'll do it. So this is a big complicated payload, and I'll, I'll go over the pieces of it in a minute. But you can see I'm just kind of doing a bunch of stuff and piping it all into Netcat to uh, Apache Traffic Server on port 80. And when I send this, you can see first we get some HTML, but then after that, we get that uh, node is deleting the server root. And uh, so it seems like we've bypassed uh, the Apache Traffic Server uh, access control, right? It's, it's we've bypassed the rule that we can no, not send delete requests for slash. So how did this work? Um, well, first, uh, this is what node sees, right? Node sees a request with a transfer encoding chunked. Uh, and then it sees the first chunk as having size two. So remember, sizes are in yellow, data is in pink. Uh, so the first chunk has size two. And then we have semicolon A as data. And then we have another two length chunk and then 2D as data, followed by a zero length chunk. And a zero length chunk indicates the end of the chunked message body. And then we have a delete request. And the delete request is trying to delete slash and it has a message body with some more stuff in it. Okay. Now Apache traffic server is going to see something that starts out very similar. It sees you know a post request for slash, transfer encoding chunked. And then it sees a chunk of length two but it sees carriage return, carriage return, and then semicolon A. And it's going to treat that, that as bad white space followed by a chunk extension. And I didn't mention this earlier, but in a chunk extension, the, the value of the key value pair is optional. So semicolon A is a valid chunk extension. Uh, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, chunk extensions are useless and are just ignored. So uh, Apache traffic server is going to see this, and it's just going to say, OK, this is meaningless, and I'll just ignore this. these four junk bytes. Carriage return, carriage return, semicolon A. OK, and then you have uh, a chunk, uh, you know, some chunk data, 0, 2, and then some uh, length, uh, 2D, and then some more data, which happens to contain a delete request, but that's not important. It's just data as far as ATS is concerned. Then you have an empty chunk indicating the end of the message body. And then you have a, you know, a normal looking get request for slash. So uh, in short, it node sees post slash, delete slash, and ATS sees post slash, get slash. And so here's the reason why we got past the access control list. Uh, but if you've been reading carefully, you might notice that this content length is actually way too large. So uh, there's not 183 bytes in this pink region down here. Uh, but for some reason, we have a content length of 183 set up here. And the reason for that is that Apache traffic server uh, is transforming the requests a little bit as it receives them. So when Apache traffic server gets a get slash request, it's going to insert a bunch of extra headers into that request, um, just saying who the original connection was from. And it puts a big version string in there with a UUID of some kind. Uh, and then it adds a host header. So it does all kinds of stuff. It basically just takes small requests and makes them big. Uh, so it turns out that this is something like 183 bytes uh, and then when you add on this zero carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, the lengths all work out and everything is good. So that's why we have to make the, the uh, content length a little bit bigger than it seems. That took me way too long to figure out and was very satisfying once I finally got it. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this bug used to be present in Google Cloud, and that is true. Uh, it also used to be present in Akamai, and uh, in both of those places, it could be used to poison cache and to bypass access controls. So Google Cloud calls these things Google Cloud Armor policies. Uh, and you could just get around any of them by, uh, as long as your back end was based on Node uh, by using this technique. Uh, and Node-based Google Cloud backends was really common because they offer an in-house service called Google Cloud Functions that is basically a way of very easily starting up simple Node web applications. So uh, um, yeah, you could just bypass any of their Armor policies for those. Um, and they gave us a $6,000 bounty for figuring that out.
Um, you could also poison cache and do the same thing on Akamai. Akamai does not have a bug bounty program for their CDN, which I believe is their largest product, uh, but that is uh, changing soon. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that develops um, as, it, as it comes out. Okay, so um, that was a more complicated bug. It took some more complicated techniques to figure out. And so the, the, the basic idea here is that we, we set up many, many HTTP servers and proxies in Docker, and we call this uh, sort of conglomeration of servers and proxies the HTTP garden. So I'm going to go into the design of the HTTP garden and how we use it to find bugs in servers. So it basically looks like this. You have this driver script, and everything revolves around the driver script. The driver script sends a request to a transducer such as get slash. The transducer forwards that request to an echo server, and maybe it transforms or modifies that request in some way. The echo server is going to take the request. It's going to just stick another HTTP start line and headers on top of that and forward it back to the transducer. So now the, the, content, the, the request that it received is now the message body of the response that it is sending. The transducer is going to send that onto the driver script again. Now the driver script is going to strip off the start line and headers from what it receives from the transducer to be able to, what it's left with after that is going to be the transformed version of the request that it sent, i.e. the thing on this second edge here. This is what the driver script wants to know. It wants to know when I send this request to the transducer, how does the request change? Then it'll take that modified request and send it along to a whole bunch of different servers that we have configured. And there's 20 to 30 of these at this point. Um, and they're all set up to respond uh, in the same exact way, uh, which is with a JSON structure that uh, conveys their interpretation of the request that they received. Uh, so it says, you know, here's what I thought the headers were. Here's what I read the URI to be. Here's what I read the version string to be. Here's what I saw as the message body. Um, I believe that is it, but I might be, oh, and also the method, right? The, the method of the request is also conveyed inside of that, that structure. And then the driver script just compares them all and sees like, okay, did any of these servers misinterpret what I just sent or misinterpret it relative to their peers? Then uh, once those responses are received, at the same time, we have a, uh, we're using uh, AFL++, uh, which is a, a fuzzer that is uh, capable of working with coverage information. So it's, it's basically tracking the execution of all of the servers or of many of the servers, and it's trying to optimize uh, what inputs trigger more interesting execution in more of the servers. And this is, when I say we're using AFL++, I really mean we're using the, the coverage collection from AFL++. The rest of the logic we had to write ourselves. Um, but yeah, we collect coverage from the servers. We, uh, uh, using AFL++, we process it, and we use that as signal to try to generate more interesting inputs, which we feed back to the driver script, and then the whole thing repeats in a loop. And so we run that for a while, and it just starts telling us about bugs, and then we report them and fix them and see if they're exploitable and move on. So the basic uh, sort of... Um, insights upon which this is this whole thing is built is just that servers convey their understanding of a request through their scripting backends. So using PHP and Apache, we can extract a big list of all the headers that were sent in a request. Uh, so that means we can understand Apache's parts tree of the request using the scripting backend, using PHP. And this goes for any scriptable server or any server that even just supports fast CGI or to some extent CGI. Um, and then the second kind of insight is that uh, we, can we can see what a transducer is actually doing to requests by just pointing it at an echo server. Uh, so putting those together, we have this, uh, this HTTP garden from which we can very easily experiment and type in and play around with requests, but also fuzz uh, these different servers through the garden and, uh, and see how they respond to various uh, generated inputs. Okay, so these are all the different servers, proxies, uh, and you know other other transducers that are uh, configured inside of the the garden. 
for the vast majority of these, we have found at least one meaningful bug um, for some definition of meaningful. Uh, but for uh, at least many of them, we have found uh, vulnerabilities that allow you to do request smuggling, um, at least with some other uh, proxy or, or endpoint. So um, yeah, we've, we've gotten a whole lot of uh, interesting results out of this. Um, now I should mention some of these targets are actually not hosted within the garden. So the garden is based on Docker and lots of these things, you know, like you cannot self-host Akamai or AWS CloudFront uh, and you can't run Microsoft IIS inside of Docker. So some of these things just have to not be hosted within the services and we, uh, we um, just host them on external servers and we can we have it integrated enough that we can just set up external services as well and, and point the same script at them and the whole same loop applies, except for coverage collection, which is more difficult to do. Okay, so the, the, the gist of all this is just don't rely on the assumption that two parsers for the same format agree. Uh, this has been proven time and time again. Uh, there was recently a talk at, at uh, CCC about doing very similar tricks for uh, email in order to send unauthenticated email that passes DMARC. Um, uh, and it was basically just relying on the same principle. There have been plenty of things using PDF, uh, trying to you know construct malicious PDFs that look really fine uh, to, to the person vetting them, but then you pass them on to someone else and they're actually malware. Um, and then of course, this HTTP request smuggling is another instance of this same idea. Uh, just never trust the access controls in any HTTP proxy. It's just a bad idea. Uh, and make sure that your cache has really short times to live so that um, you don't, if, if someone is able to poison the cache, it at least requires sustained work. Um, yeah, and uh, just bank on other people not, not knowing that. And you could probably find bugs in their code. Cool. Some acknowledgments. Uh, we want to thank... Uh, DARPA for funding this, um, the folks at NARF for uh, also, you know, sort of funding me and uh, providing feedback uh, throughout the, the project. Um, uh, and uh, at Galois and Trail of Bits, um, similar. Uh, the Trust Lab at Dartmouth provided a lot of feedback on slides and on concepts. Uh, Google gave us $11,000 in bounties. Uh, so that was cool. Uh, there was another 5,000 for a different bug that's less interesting to describe. Um, and then um, Fastly for giving me a hat that I'm actually no longer wearing. They also gave me this cool challenge coin uh, in the mail <laughs> for uh, for finding some interesting bugs in their load balancer. Um, and that is, uh, that's it. Thank you, Ben. It was very uh, informational. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having me. So I'd be happy to take questions if anyone has any. Can you uh, put in the chat or somewhere the link to that uh, GitHub page that had some goodies in it before? Yes, yeah, so the the first, let me, uh, let me open it. So there's the demos themselves, which are here. Uh, so this is just the Docker files I was using to do the demos and you can reproduce it all for yourself. Um, the actual HTTP garden is, we're in the works, uh, the, right now it's mostly just cause I've been lazy about removing all of our, the addresses of our VPSs from it. Um, but that's just my own, uh, fault. So that will be, that is currently private, but when it is up, will be under, um, under this, uh, URL, which I can send, but will currently 404. Um, um, or actually, no, right now it, it may not 404, but it will, it'll either 404 or be empty, but it is, uh, it's ongoing. We're going to GPL the whole thing. Um, we have approval from the company, so that's all, that's all good. It's just, uh, on my end, having not actually read through all the code and removed all the un, unpublished bugs from the thing. Uh, we have a bunch of vulnerabilities. We are still not supposed to talk about. So I need to remove all references to those. And then uh, that should be good to go at that second link. Yeah, cool, thanks. I'll keep an eye out on those.
Another question I had is uh, back to the beginning when you were first, uh, I think you just really before you introduced um, request smuggling and you're talking about um, message links with negative values and it would kind of back the pointer up. I was curious, what happens if you put in a negative value that's so so negative that it goes back beyond the beginning of your original request? Does it end up leaking memory or can it do other things Get the prior requests? Yeah, I don't know. Let's try it. Um, I'll just share my screen again and we can just see what happens. That is a good idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's let's do it. So it was uh, mongoose and the attacker container. And OK, so the request should look something like this. So it's going to be get slash HTTP 1.1 content link uh, minus, uh, let's say, 40. Right? That'll get us to be one byte before the, be the beginning of this. And then uh, no message body would be necessary. But just for consistency with the example, we'll put in the same 10 byte message body. So what you believe will happen is that it will leak one byte of memory from before the get. Right? That's the goal. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, OK. I think that's very plausible. Um, I didn't send that to anything. <laughs> uh, OK, let's try that again. Um, and oh, wrong port. One more time. We get no response, but we do see that some kind of get re request happened. That's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe this is a no get request and a no thing here is unthinkable because it's possible it seems likely that a no would be there in here. Maybe we could test that by sending something like this. So send two requests uh, and we'll put a message body on this one with one byte. And we'll put like a Z here, right? So we'll see if, if by doing this, do we get get followed by a whole bunch of Z gets. Um, uh, no, we don't, which is... Want to see a real hacker in action? Look at this guy. <laughs> I, I mean, wouldn't have expected that. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Malcolm, I would have expected that what we just did to totally work, and it did not. I don't know why. We'll have to look into that uh, maybe at a later right. time. But it does seem like uh, trying to use this to index out of bounds on the request buffer causes at least different behavior from indexing negative but within bounds. I don't, and indexing into the prior request also seems to cause some weird behavior. So uh, I have no explanations for you. Uh, this was fixed in Mongoose 7.10. So if you check out Mongoose 7.9, you'll be able to use the, the vulnerable version and perhaps you can figure it out. I don't, I don't know what the, what's going on here. It requires some, some further thinking. Okay, is that container in the Shmukon demo? Get yeah, yep, that okay. container is there. Yeah, maybe I'll try to play with that in, a, in my infinite free game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me know if, uh, if you find anything with that infinite time. Well, uh, thanks again, Ben. I'm probably going to split here, but I really appreciate the talk and also the um, the information about the kind of the local um, community here. Uh, I don't know if I'll make it. I don't know if I can make it to tomorrow evening's meetup, um, but I can probably do Friday lunch. Um, you said that's at the Trust Lab, or. The Sean's or the Sean, Sean Smith lab. Ben, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Um, that's going to be an ECSC 214. Um, his website's really out of date. Sean's website um, doesn't actually say that, but I will. Um, I'll, I'm, I have an email drafted here. I'll CC the guy who, who maintains the mailing list. And uh, yeah, just uh, send your order to him for lunch. Uh, by like it's usually like 11 a.m. What uh, I can order lunch. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a real service that uh, that Sean's offering to the to the world there. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. What time? Uh, what time does it um start? Um. Uh, yeah, this is a good question for Seth. Usually twelve or twelve thirty. Um, and it actually alternates Thursday, Friday, and I'm only mostly sure that this week is a Friday week, but okay. um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure this week is a Friday week. Okay. Uh, so it should, it should be, should be fine. 12 or 1230 ish. It will say in the email that should come out tomorrow night. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll look for that. Thanks for taking my email. And sure. uh, yeah, I look forward to hopefully uh, meeting you in person in the near future. Yeah. All right. Twice. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Good night. I guess I'll go as well. <laughs> yep. Good night, way. Ben. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Sure. I'm going to go stop the recording. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll be heading out too. I really got to pee now. <laughs> <laughs>